in shaping the way that um, uh, we look as a program at our relationship between academic learning and experiential learning through the voice of people like ourselves and the history uh, becoming real through narration. And through Mary Marshall, we have had an incredible amount of uh, discoveries in our program. One of them was the interviewing, oh, excuse me, the oral history of the Revson Fellows, um, at least one of whom is here with us tonight, whom, Cheryl Green, whom we, in, whom we took the oral history of four years ago, um, and whose history has actually shaped the lives of a number of students who are now graduating from our program. After that experience, Mary Marshall gave us Maurice Scatino um, as our mentor in oral history. And two years ago, Marie was the one who taught us how to create a community history. And all our 180 first year students created uh, projects in community history in New York City, presenting them and uh, really teaching us all an incredible amount. The next year, Mary Marshall Clark gave us Sarah Desick, who now defected back to the Center for Oral History, um, not without changing our lives in the, in the Columbia Undergraduate Scholars Program. And many of our students still go back to Sarah for mentorship and summer projects and so on. Of all these contacts, we have all been pining to hear Rita Sharon talk. I know she has spoken to our colleagues in the pre-professional office and the Center for Student Advising, and she is always a big draw. So it was an incredible pleasure for me to be uh, asked to co-sponsor this event with, um, with ICER and with the Columbia Center for Oral History. And without any further ado, I am going to introduce Marie, who will then introduce our main speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Lavinia, and um, thank you for um, co-sponsoring this event in this lovely room. It's very welcome um, freshness so, um, on this first day of spring. Um, it's uh, a good privilege and a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rita Sharon this evening. Um, Dr. Sharon is a general internist and narratologist at Columbia University and the founder and executive director of the program in narrative medicine. She completed her MD at Harvard in 1978 and a PhD in English here at Columbia in 1999. And her research focuses on the doctor-patient relationships, um, narrative skill in medicine, and reflective practice. So we see lots of connections in the long history of this. Um, she has received a Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Reg Residency, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and research funding from the NIH, NEH, and several private foundations. She's lectured widely on narrative medicine and published in many journals. Um, the, um, she's the author of a book, A Narrative Medicine, um, Honoring the Stories of Illness, and one of the chapters on narrative competence, I feel like, is a, is a, a lesson, a, a whole course in oral history on its own. Um, it's a remarkable uh, text. And she's the co-author of Stories Matter, The Role of Narrative and Medi Medical Ethics, and the Psychoanalysis in Narrative Medicine. Currently, Dr. Sharon is working on a new book on narrative medicine, and another on the last stories of Henry James. Please join me in welcoming <coughs>
ways of thinking about the world can coexist. Um, I mean, those of you in the undergraduate scholars program are uh, maybe going to go off and become engineers or, or astrophysicists or, or God knows what. And yet, you're, you're, uh, you're smart enough to know that what you can come to know about things like telling and listening to narratives on the one hand and um, uh, kind of how the world works by listening to others talk about it, that this matters. Hmm? When I say clearings, um, uh, the work we've done within, within clinical settings, I'm an internist, but the people I work with are, are kind of those of us who care for the sick. And um, what we find is that in doing work like uh, what Mary Marshall in her group does with oral history, the kind of deeply, deeply attentive, dutiful, attention to what another tells of self. Um, that this is what's called for in the care of the sick. And as we invite others to come think about this with us, we end up with nurses, physical therapists, chaplains, ethicists, patients, families, interpreters, um, um, transport workers, you know, the people who push the gurneys back and forth from the ER, uh, all of them kind of magnetized into this work. And we find over and over again that we have formed a clearing, which, you know, I hope you know as soon as I say that, I, I hope, <laughs> as soon as I say clearing, you think of kind of an oak forest with very dense trees, and then suddenly you come across a slightly open space, yes? And, and the, the, the moss is underfoot, and there's space suddenly, and, and maybe the sunlight pools, and you have a space of protection, safety, where creatures gather. So, <laughs> Consider yourself a creature gathering, uh, because I, I believe. Um, well, let's 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 start kind of thinking about what, in particular, the narrativity does to medicine. Uh, but I hope you'll agree with me after a little while that indeed uh, we're here, whatever our relationship to illness or care of the sick might be, and most of you have nothing to do, I understand, with illness. <coughs> um, and as soon as I say that, I also say, there ain't anybody in here who's not intimately involved with illness, if only in the effort to forestall it. Right. So I'm gonna read some of this because some of it kind of the words matter, and uh, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, I warn you now that at a certain point I will ask you to do some work with me. Uh, uh, so so um, uh, hold on to your hats because you're, you're gonna you're gonna take you're gonna take some part in what it is we think we can <coughs> expose and discover about what it takes to hear stories of illness. So I'm gonna read a little thing that, that I wrote um, not long ago on an airplane. A full silver moon rested on the horizon of Greenland. Although clouds obscured the landmass of Greenland itself as my airplane flew over it, the moon's textured face offered the still point as I gazed out the plane's portal. The clouds parted when we crossed the northern reaches of Canada, not 
far from where the Hudson Bay joins the Labrador Sea. There was revealed a moonscape-like apparition of silver and black peaks and crevices. Either rock or ice, I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell what I was looking at. Either rocks or ice, the sculpted undulations were shining, contoured, unmoving, and boundless. I felt what Shelley must have felt on seeing Mont Blanc. I felt what he called in the poem, the sublime. Uh, and I have a few lines of that poem so you know what I'm talking about. The works and ways of men, their death and birth, and that of him and all that his may be, all things that move and breathe with toil and sound are born and die, revolve, subside, and swell. Power dwells apart in this tranquility, remote, serene, and inaccessible, and this the naked countenance of earth on which I gaze. Even these primeval mountains teach the adverting mind. Not necessarily beauty. What I looked at from my airplane window was the powerful, incontrovertible, unassailable statement made by something by virtue of being itself. All other passengers on the plane seemed to sleep with the shades drawn against this incredible sight. I sensed I was the only human being looking at it for that hour looking at that face of the planet. And I have a feeling that even the pilots who are driving the plane on these transatlantic flights are not looking at the scene. So I fully believe that I was the only human looking at it. With Bach's orchestral suites flaring in my earphones, I beheld a massive object, that part of the Earth's northern crust, that appeared to have no end. In beholding it, I was as if chosen for a privilege. I was bestowed a rare prospect on the elemental planet on which we live. I was the only one looking at it, I felt quite sure. And that fact conferred on me the responsibility to look at it, to take it in to fulfill the duties incurred by virtue of its having been revealed to me. I carry with me the apparition of the master, the silent, the unmoving continent, inhabited by beings invisible to me yet there, always there in the north, and yet most likely, most often, absolutely unseen. I fulfill my duty toward it, in part, by describing it to you. So, I know I've been um, asked to tell you a little bit about what, what narrative medicine is, and I want to do that because I'm a zealot. Because those of us who have developed this way of thinking about the character set feel that we have locked into something. Uh, the we here is uh, initially a small group of Columbia faculty from English, cinema studies, philosophy, um, um, pediatrics, family medicine, psychoanalytic institute, internal medicine. Uh, we had to borrow someone from Sarah Lawrence uh, from the patient advocacy department because we don't have one here. And this small group started some years ago um, meeting almost weekly for a period of a year. I got some money from them in uh, to really say, what is this about in, in clinical settings these days that doctors, nurses, social workers, psychotherapists, physical therapists, are being encouraged to read and write. Well, what's that about? What's it for? Uh, we've been doing it for a while, but we didn't know why. Truly, it was under-theorized. And 
so we wanted to develop theory that might account for why narrative work was useful to clinicians. And, and we came up for a piece in theorizing, in figuring out what are the intermediates here, what are the mechanisms by which it helps the doctor or social worker to do what it is that a sick person needs. <coughs> to the point, and then we started kind of gingerly writing about this and uh, uh, inviting other people to come in and work with us. Uh, a lot of the book that, from, you know, that, that you were talking about uh, came from that collaboration with this group of Columbia faculty. And then we, we started um, making um, um, small training workshops for people who would come in for weekends and spend a little time, very, very short course, very small introduction to some of the work. And they would like, uh, it would be very, very important to them. And more and more people came from farther and farther and farther away, you know, so we had Australians and Japanese and South Koreans and South Africans, and they would come for a weekend to do this work. And we didn't get exactly how much of a break it was from what typically goes on in medical schools and nursing schools. And we felt like, it, it's kind of like parents of a gifted child might feel. You know, like where did this kid come from? We didn't know, but we felt dutiful to it. You know, how do we, you know, what do we do? Send them to a private school? Do you see what I mean? This, this thing that came from the work that we did impressed us because we didn't know about it. We didn't know about it before it came. So that's what I want to, so I'm going to tell you kind of different parts of the kind of work we found ourselves doing and, and different ways in which we've been theorizing. Why is it that the capacity to read like a close reader, to write with some skill, to represent in words or in pictures, most of us use words, but you could use you know, photographs or paintings, to represent very complicated events, states of affairs, things that happen to persons. The capacity to represent these very highly complex, highly charged situations involving illness. Why this matters, and I'll tell you now the punchline, it matters because the person perceiving it, like me from my airplane, the person perceiving it has got to have the capacity to represent, to confer form on what it is that's perceived. Otherwise, that which is perceived is lost. Once a thing perceived has form conferred on it, and you guys know what I'm talking about by form, once it's a story, or a play, or a movie, or a obituary, or a love letter, or a painting, or a scene, <coughs> Once it's got form, it can then be seen. It becomes visible to the one who conferred form on it, to the writer, the painter, the, the, the mahler, as well as to those who then read it, or view it, or behold it. So we, we've kind of distilled some of these emerging uh, uh, ways of looking at this. Um, so one way to say it is that narrative medicine provides clinicians, and uh, this goes beyond doctors and nurses, and so the word clinicians is the best I can do to um, include in that theory all who care for the sick. So if you're a chaplain, if you're a, a, a receptionist in my clinic, if you're the lady who does the insurance, uh, 
evaluations, uh, you're a clinician. Uh, and, and this is an elastic term. It includes those who care for the sick, which can include, you know, daughters and mothers, neighbors. So narrative medicine provides clinicians with the tools to hear what ill persons say, to receive their challenging, grueling, hard accounts of self, to face the condition of knowing what they hear, and then to be able to extend help. Illness exposes the self at exactly the same time that the self resists exposure. Often, whether the illness is the result of trauma, habits, genes, or chance, the person afflicted with the illness feels, or worse, is made to feel, to blame for it. Medical problems in particular parts of the body related to sex, excretion, behaviors that connote weakness, like drugs and alcohol and things like that, eating, are particularly hard to expose without the sense of shame. And the road toward diagnosis and treatment of medical conditions almost always entail, entails stripping naked in front of strangers or telling strangers things that are difficult to say aloud. The sick person suffers a sudden loss, a loss of function, a loss of power, a loss of the future, and has at the same time to tell all and yet yearns to hide all. This explosive mixture of need and shame complicates the giving and receiving of care and illness. <coughs> so in what feel what feel like, they not, they're not necessarily this, but they feel like dark rooms, silent rooms, rooms with duct taped doors, rooms scanned for bugs, rooms in which one speaks in code, rooms outside of which there are machines that manufacture white noise. Rooms in which one writes in invisible ink. In these rooms does the care proceed. These are the rooms of care. In the dark of knowledge, in the silence of truth, our patients find some way to tell us. We find some way to hear them. And then we seek ways to fulfill the duties incurred by virtue of having heard. The methods of narrative medicine were developed to help those who care for the sick to absorb what can be learned from the patient. Our work arose in response to the lesions in mainstream healthcare that sick persons are often left and this is indeed the lament. This is the lament that led to our work to begin with. That sick persons are often left unheard, unrecognized within their illnesses, their fears, and their horrible uncertainties. While the doctor or nurse or therapist is also saddled with great uncertainties. And sometimes, oftentimes, made unavailable to the sick person because of that. Our teaching methods include training in close reading, reflective writing, and attentive listening. It's very, very simple. It's really training in developing a sense of story. These methods awaken the imagination, expand the mind, invite a creative response, and allow for discovery and all of this together enables, it doesn't cause, but it enables mutual recognition between whoever the teller is and whoever the listener is. 
and, and this is what I meant by the clearings, in which it doesn't matter who's in it. Typically, it'll be, uh, you know, doctors, nurses, patients, and family members, or something like that. Um, that, that these, these persons committed to health in one way or another can gather in relative safety and, and protection. By strengthening the clinician's capacity to perceive, to literally see, to perceive, to get, to comprehend, to grasp, to see what goes on in their patients' lives, we enable them to make contact with patients, to learn what's at stake, and to come to understand how best to help. All of this replaces the shame with honor, for what could possibly be more honorable than a human being struggling against the problems of mortality? So I'm a general internist. I work up in the clinic in Presbyterian Hospital. I take care of people with asthma or diabetes or cancer or depression or alcoholism or obesity. I mean, you know. Gentlemen. Most of my patients are old and sick and poor, and so they do not do well. Some suffer from catastrophic injury, massive strokes, violence, and some suffer from non catastrophic injury, chronic disease, remediable disease, problems of living. All have a great deal to tell to me, their interns and also to themselves. And I've learned rather early on that the dividend of letting someone talk to me in the office is that they can overhear themselves. Now, I need, to, I need to talk a little bit about the body in particular, not just because I'm a general internist and I know her really well, but because I think, I think we need to concentrate on the predicament of the body as we talk about suffering of any kind. We all, clinicians, um, are gradually coming to appreciate this position we have at the side of the sick. For we realize how much we come to know through our practice as nurses, doctors, social workers, chaplains, about the living and dying that surround Sometimes, oftentimes, we wish we didn't have to know all we learned about the world, about the violence, the unfairness, the needless suffering. We learn through our long, hard apprenticeships at the needs of injury and illness that we are all mortals and we will all die. When a person is physically or emotionally injured, or falls to disease, we are the ones who answer the call for help. When that injured serviceman, when that raped woman, when that child with asthma, when that old man losing his mind says, in whatever way he or she can, I have been injured, what is to be done? We are the ones who answer that call. Now, and this is why I have to bring in the body so, so uh, explicitly. Um, the call is most frequently sounded. This call, I have been injured, what is to be done? The call is most frequently sounded in sectors of healthcare. Because the body is the thing that connects the human being to the world. And because the body is, in strict terms, that which is violated in all of these situations of disease or trauma, it falls to those who care for the body to heed the call of the injured self within it. Uh, and I say that in full mind, that physical injury is but one little stratum of suffering. I realize that full well. But there's something a little peculiar about the way we live today. 
that suffering comes to healthcare before it goes to other places, simply because, I don't know, we don't have confessors or something. Do you see, are, are you with me? That, that if you think of where does the suffering person go, you're more likely to say the ER than anything else. It's a sadness about the culture we live in, but so it goes. But there are other things too that, that we need to be <coughs> cognizant of as we think about the care of the sick. Were it not for the body, and, and I include the senses, the locomotion, the emotions, the appetites, the pleasures, were it not for the body, the, sen the self within, and again, I, I use self kind of in italics, whatever word you'd like to use that connotes kind of who, roughly speaking, you refer to when you say me, whatever that is, that's what I mean. So I put self in quotation. <coughs> Were it not for the body, the self within would never make contact of any kind with the world. The tragedy, some say, is that with a body, life ends. The bounty is that with a body, we express ourselves, and we enjoy whatever pleasure can be ours. I mean, we write, we paint, we dance, we make love. We take in the silver crescent moon setting in the west. We smell our baby's head. We receive the beauty of Mozart's clarinet. The cave paintings of Lascaux would not be there were it not for the bodies of the ones doing it, nor yet the ones beholding it. It's with our body, and this is not a stretch, it's with our body that we appreciate the perfection of the sentence of Henry James. We fall head over heels in love. We think new thoughts. We eat with gusto. We hit the line dry. Can these bounties be worth their coming to an end? In his latest novel called The Infinities, no, now it's not his latest. I think he just published another. John Danville. Did he just publish another novel, John Danville? I think he might have. Anyway, in his novel, The Infinities, uh, John Banville stages a scene on Mount Olympus where Zeus and his fellow gods gaze down at the hapless mortals they have created. Zeus envies our mortality. Quote, this is the mortal world. It is a world where nothing is lost, where all is accounted for, while yet the mystery of things is preserved. A world where they may live, however briefly, however tenuously, in the failing evening of the self, solitary and at the same time together, somehow, here in this place, dying as they may be, and yet fixed forever in a luminous, unending instant. So, so, if that's what mortality might be, uh, this care of the body takes on a um, moment. It takes on a moment uh, in, in these rising days and failing evenings of the self. So that gives us all the more urgency to say, what are the duties incurred by virtue of doing that care? What does it mean to be the curator of this body? Um, we know somehow that the body itself, with the self who inhabits it, of course, that the body becomes the, the ground of care as the thing that connects the self to the world. It then is the thing that connects the suffering being to the body and the self of the caregiver who might actually help. 
the injury itself, and when I say injury, I'm including all of the things that might cause suffering. The injury itself speaks, although perhaps not in words or physical findings that mean what they think of me. It speaks in a foreign tongue, and the receiver of these tellings of injury or disease must be fluent in that tongue. It means having extra senses or skills uh, um, with which they can interpret and translate that which is shown or told by that patient. So I hope you see I hope you see what I'm getting at. These are contours of stories. And uh, illness comes to us within uh, or or as we get to see the illness, the only way to see it is in how it unfolds in stories. At the very, very beginning, something happens in your body, and it's your body that tells you there's something awry. And then if you listen to it, you might, you know, say to somebody, you might say to your, I don't know, your, your, your brother or your lover or somebody, there's something wrong with my shoulder. And you say, well, what's a nice sign? And then if it keeps, you know, you might say something to the trainer at the gym, the guy in the drugstore. Ultimately, you're going to tell this to some nurse or doctor or EMT. And what do they do with it? They turn around and tell it to one another. And they tell it and retell it and retell it until somebody figures out what to do. So the whole business from the very beginning of symptoms unfolds in this series of, of tellings. Um, now, it's commonly thought or commonly said that stories have beginnings and middles and ends. And, but the stories we see in healthcare are just not like that. They're more like storms at sea than, than straight lines. I mean, they come from nowhere. Winds come, waves tower, horizons tilt, ships sink, winds subside. I mean, it's, it's, it's a conflagration, typically. So, uh, you know, maybe the meteorologist will say the storm started here and peaked there and ended there. But those who live on that shore know that the storm never ends because the shore changes by virtue of it. <coughs> For those who lose homes and people to it, the storm rewrites the plot of being, altering without end the life. So, so these stories of illness are um, ongoing. They are without end. They are ongoing. I mean, the trauma or the injury or the disease might start in some moment, but then, as, as the oral historian knows better than we, um, um, it's got its afterlife. It's got its afterlife. And, you know, the clinician will do the best he or she can with, you know, sail. And yet, how many eroded coasts have we traveled? How many shipwrecks have we seen? Novelist Alexander Hemmen writes about the death of his baby daughter of a brain tumor. Quote, I could not have begun to imagine the intensity of the pain we felt as the nurses removed all the tubes and wires and everyone cleared out and Terry and I held our dead child. How do you step out of a moment like that? How do you leave your dead child behind and return to the vacant routines of whatever you called your life? So, so we can accept that our clinical duty includes the duty to develop this sense of story, this sense of what is it that this father and mother underwent in the course of this infant's brain tumor and chemotherapy and radiation and surgery and intensive care and uh, multiple efforts to resuscitate and then finally death. That those of us caring for that child and that mommy and daddy and that little sister or big sister to the baby 
uh, had to appreciate not just the bits of it, but the story entire. That we have to develop the skills necessary to understand what those parents of that dying baby need from us to comprehend the losses of the woman after having been raped, to face the uncertain future with the middle-aged man now speechless after a stroke. Only with this sense of story will we be able to contribute what sick persons and their families need, either to get better or to suffer the consequences of their loss of health. Hemant ends his account of the death of his baby daughter, Isabel, by realizing that, quote, her indelible absence is now an organ in our bodies whose sole function is a continuous secretion of sorrow. In the midst of the storm of trauma or illness, those who care for the parents will, it is hoped, sense this physiology of loss, not as something that will end, but as a story that lives on, altering without end the life, engaging all who undergo it and who accompany it in a community of women. It doesn't let us off the hook. So, as a general internist, I spend my days in the office touching patients' bodies, measuring the material of the ingredients of that body, interpreting changes in that body, and arriving with patients at some decisions about what to, what to do about the state of their body. And throughout the process, I'm granted the privileged gaze at the individual uh, within his or her body, and yet overflowing from that body into this self in the world. And, uh, you know, I again have to mention that, that nowadays it's the doctor or nurse who in some way is going to be the entree into care for suffering. That for some peculiar reason, one has to prove that some suffering, some unwellness is not being caused by something in one of the organs. And when it's proven that it's not a malfunction of one of the organs, well then we can think about what might cause suffering and unhappiness. Do you see? And, and that always breaks down, of course, because if you come to me with a headache and I do CAT scans and MRIs and hot to trot. And then I say, your brain is fine. All the tests are negative, right? All the tests are negative. And you say, what about my head? And I say, well, there's nothing wrong. It doesn't help at all. You know, I mean, it's all in your head. It's essentially what they're saying. Do you see? So, so the person doesn't have an answer to what is causing the suffering. And now they're made to feel stupid because they bothered you with a complaint that's not real. So it's goofy, it's backward, and eventually we'll get it better. But that's how we are right now. So because of that, many of us um, now practicing what, what we might call narrative medicine, start instead with another opening. Um, uh, some time ago, I, I finally stopped doing all the inventory questions. If any of you been, have been to a doctor recently, you know that there's like a thousand questions that, that you have to answer, either on a checklist before you get there, or to the nurse in the waiting room, or to the doctor who's kind of clerking the records. And it's, you know, um, um, well, we usually start at the top. Do you have headaches? Do you have trouble with your vision? Do you have trouble with your hearing? Do you have trouble with your swallowing? Do you get frequent uh, uh, nose boots? Do you get frequent sore throats? 
Do you have trouble with your breathing? Have you ever smoked cigarettes? Have you ever smoked it? I mean, all the way down from top to bottom. And, and uh, every organ system gets 10 or 20 questions. So that tends to set up the conversation in a way that doesn't really allow for things beyond that scaffold. So we've learned instead to, well, I usually say two questions as I meet a patient for the first time. Uh, I will be your doctor, and so I need to learn a great deal about your body and your health and your life. Please tell me what you think I should know about your situation. And when we do it that way, um, blessedly free from the obligation to ask a million questions, um, instead of getting the answers to the million questions, we get an account of self that's framed within the life of the person who brings the account. And many patients don't quite know. One lady says, you want me to talk? And so, so um, and what I had to learn how to do did not come easy was to not write to not type, to put my hands in my lap, and to pay attention, and to absorb from the person giving an account what words she said, what movements, where the silences came, where the tears came, where the posture changed, what the mood in the room was, what my body was doing in response, how I found myself leaning forward, uh, and to the extent that I could not just look for the medically salient part of what was said, to the extent that I could desist from barging in with my own medical questions, did I learn what really needed to be known about what the suffering was all about. And you know, many times what a person might say is, well, my, my right elbow has been hurting since I was in that car accident. I mean, sometimes it's very straightforward. And that's, you know, fine, that's easy. But most of the time it's not. And so by doing it in that way, and by equipping myself with what it takes to absorb the, the that which is conveyed in such a giving, an account of self, um, the better we could save so much time that unnecessarily would have gone into chasing every itsy bitsy, oh, you're short of breath, is it? And then you're, do you understand? So, so this is one example of a, a simple routine of narrative medicine that shifts the ground of care. Now, when I'm doing the physical exam, I'll always ask the questions like, when was your last PPD, and what are you allergic to, and, and, and tell me about that scar. So, so, you know, we manage to do the business, but it's always in the grounds of how this person may frame that which he or she came into the office. I saw last week in the office a patient I've known for almost 30 years. I met her when I became the internist for her mother, who was then dying of thyroid cancer. And the mother had gotten good treatment and had lived for a long time with a bad cancer, but it ultimately had become metastatic, and that's the time at which I had become her internist, and she died soon after, um, after that. Her daughter was stalwart, non-stinting, unconditionally committed to the care of her mother. After her mother's death, the daughter asked me to become her doctor, which was a privilege and meant a great deal to me. Together, the daughter and I have weathered her own thyroid disease, a major clinical depression with psychotic features, uh, a meaning she was hallucinating when she was, she was psychotic. Uh, a multitude of physical problems. Uh, and we solved lots of problems. We were, we were very kind of 
gleeful as we solved problems together. She had this horrible back pain, wouldn't go away no matter what she did, all the physical therapy. We finally, she's the one who said, I need my breasts reduced. They're much too big, and I think they're the thing causing my back pain. I would never have thought of it. But we had to go through breast reduction surgery and cure it. And this was very cool. She recently underwent thyroid surgery herself, not for cancer, but for a, 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 a abnormality of the gland. It was benign. It was the cyst, but the, the growth had limited the function of her thyroid gland, and so she needed that removed. As she sat on my examining table last week, I gently fingered the well-healing scar of the operation. We wordlessly looked at one another, knowing all that lied beneath that scar for her, the mourning for her mother, the fear that someday a cancer will develop in her own head, our relief that the pathology did not show any cancer cells. We celebrated, wordlessly, gravely, her courage in having been able to submit to the surgery at all. We appreciated that her severe depression had not come back in the face of this physical assault, but that we knew what to do with it did. After examining her neck where the surgery had been done, I listened to her heart and lungs. I examined her belly. I checked her skin for anything untold. Throughout the physical exam, I felt the magnitude of the significance of my hands on her body. It was as if I were worshiping her continued health, saying through my physical contact with her that we were united in her care. I called her last week to tell her about to tell her how much it meant to me to see her, and that I had felt very close to her, having seen her through so much. I had been writing this about her, and I wanted to send it to her, because I was just myself um, moved by the encounter. So I, wrote, I, I sent her in the mail this short description, and she called me as soon as she got it to say, that she too felt grateful for the work we had done together. And I, re I read this to you now, having gotten her permission to do, to do so. What we have come to know through our long clinical relationship is that the boundaries of care do not separate the body from the self. That both of us bring our bodies and ourselves to the effort to support her health. And in the course of doing that, we hear and tell stories. This is not unusual in this kind of practice. Um, sometimes this is acknowledged and sometimes not. But I think that the contact, this, this contact forms the foundation of any therapeutic relationship. I hope you see the point here, that the contact that we can develop through the actual physical my hand on her belly, as well as the close to physical contact between me as a listener and her as a teller, that these modes of contact form the foundation for a therapeutic relationship. We two women will make contact and that and will allow into one another some aspect of the other. It sounds a little mystical or goofy, but I think this situation is what occurs in any intersubjective relationship, a relationship of love, a friendship, a teaching. Um, but that within the setting of the care of the sick, we have this other dimension, which is my hand on her belly. And that is said with as much reverence as I can say. So, so the two of us then, clinician and patient, are united 
on the grounds of her illness. United in the fundamental search for meaning and the means to navigate this very uh, primordial, I mean the underneath, <laughs> the, the underneath, the basic state of being a mortal human being. Although, although the disease or the fear of it or the effort to prevent it may be the pretext for our visit, once united in the effort to face mortality, we are launched as well at the same time on self-creation through, through this contact. So I think what it means is now, in this culture anyway, that of all things, the clinical office becomes a site for deep existential work. In addition to checking the numbers and giving the flu shot and, and, and uh, treating medical conditions and staving off those we can stave off, that we're united in this risky, high stakes venture, not just of, of the physical ongoing mess, but really very profoundly in what it means to be a mortal human being. And because the body provides the stage for mortality, the very situation of mortality surfaces most predictably and powerfully when worries of bodily health and death present themselves. So, being curator of the body appoints us doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals to care for that body in all its instants, accounting for its parts and yet respecting its mystery. My beholding this woman who is under my care is a heightened experience through which I incur the duties to register what I see to appreciate what I see, to recognize its uniqueness, to be summoned to look at what I am granted the privilege to perceive. As I recruit what I know of internal medicine that might help her, I summon as well my sense of the sublime. I experience the vastness of this one woman's cosmos, the powerful, incontrovertible, unassailable statement made by something by virtue of being itself. And then as I get to the very end of writing this, this essay, right now, sitting in the West Village of New York City, by coincidence, QXR, the classical radio station, plays Bach's orchestral suite. Really. Number three in D, the one that I heard on the airplane. <laughs> I, as I gazed at the Canadian continent, once again, I let this suite flare through my earphones, elevating me to wordless planes of pleasure by its beauty, its power, its harmonies. I move in concert with the suite's moves from brass and percussion fanfares to soulful, sorrowful, largo passages that haunt me back to my childhood memories of my now dead father listening to exactly this movement with such gratitude. So we are here with our heritage, our past, our connection to the living and the dead. With our adverting minds, we seek the meaning of our lives as we undergo their pain and suffering, not canceling out the joys, but sculpting them into unique monuments of self. As we are born and as we die, we revolve, subside, and swell, filled with the sustenance of others, moved into self by the mysteries of self we behold. And this goes on every day, day in, day out, by virtue of the care. So 
So thank you for listening to all of this. Well, recently, I'll just say, I've been fired in quotation marks oh. by one of my patients today. Ah. <laughs> Uncertainty is shared. You may, the, the patient may feel they know they come to the doctor to be told something and uh, forgive us, but there is such precious little that we know. And so the burdens of uncertainty could be shared, but they are usually not. And patients know this because now. You can go Google something just as well as I can. And you know what happens if you go into a, a, a physician's office with the internet, something or other, and they either say, well, that's stupid, or they get mad. Because suddenly we don't have the edge anymore. Right? I mean, it's really, it's really the emperor. Really. But, but the point I'm making is we are not separated because one group is uncertain and one group is certain, no, 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 <coughs> who are all profoundly, profoundly uh, suffering, burdened by the uncertainty. We're just hiding from one another. Uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, the professional power is undeniable. And those of us who, by virtue of having gone to professional school and suffered through all the indignities of whatever internship you went through, uh, uh, we are vested with a position. We're vested with a position that sometimes we're entreated to use as if power. Tell me what to do. What to do? Tell me what to do. I can't. Da -da. Da -da. Uh, and sometimes, of course, of course, it's uh, explained. Please. How, do, how does it, um, when you're dealing as people are aging, the patient is aging over a long time, or mental illness is like coming in? How, how uh, good is a doctor listening to that in the that Does it change? In my, my case, with my mother, in these situations, the three doctors just turned, or do you have to? Listen to her because they're, especially if people are flexing in and out of things or medications or whatever. How does that work in your family? Well, that's that's where it becomes really valuable. Um, in more ways than one, uh, the longevity of the relationship itself is valuable. They recently made the office I work in this clinic um, paperless. Suddenly, there's no paper because everything is electronic. And I, I was away, I took a little break from my practice for six months uh, to work along on these books. And I go back and they say, well, it's paperless now. And they say, uh, 
We got the guy coming tomorrow. He can shred all your medical files. <laughs> And I've been there since 1981, and I've got all of these medical files. And I say, no, 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 no. Well, well, you can come down between today and Thursday and go through them and see what you want to keep. <laughs> so, so I just want to put my foot down and say, okay, get your guy, get your guy, but instead of shredding all my stuff, put them on the dolly and bring them up to the ninth floor and I'll make room for them up there. So that's what they did. So now there's all these stacks of, of files. They go back to 1981. They've got little pictures that <coughs> my patients have drawn together of their hall ladders and things like that. Uh, half the people by now have died. I mean, they were in their 70s and 80s when I picked them up as an intern at, you know, a long time ago. So a lot of them have died. And I opened, the, I opened the lateral file drawer when they were in my file drawer. And I just see Kenneth DeCosta. I mean, he died 10, 15 years ago. But I'm not going to take him out of my file just because he died. So, <laughs> so that kind of logic that I can, and I've got even some of the old charts, that I can show Mrs. G what we did in 1984 when she came in with that belly pain. So there's some kind of longitudinal familial recognition. What patients, what patients uh, sacrifice is the feeling of being recognizable. And if I can say to someone not only that you're still recognizable, no matter what's happened to your body, no matter how much you've lost your mind, no matter how much the Parkinson's has set in, no matter how depressed you are, you see. And, and the recognition of that body, no, 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 it can't be your gallbladder because we took that out in 1984. It's beyond that. It's, it's, it's the I know who you are. So that's over the long haul but then also in the half hour. And you're saying, especially with older patients, that the doctor or nurse simply has to put up with the tangent, because somewhere in the tangent is what matters. And we are owed that. We are owed that. I get really, I get really angry when I give grand rounds and there's a bunch of internists at some hospital and they say, Dr. Sharon, who's got the time to do that? And at the beginning, I was a little naive. I'd say, well, it really doesn't take more time. You just use the time differently. And if you want to do this, you have to get good at it. But then it saves time. That's what I used to say. I don't say that. I say, and, and they say, we only get 12 minutes a patient. Nobody's going to be able to do this and then go home and write a story about it. And I say, 12 minutes, 12 minutes, says who? And that's the conversation. All right, the conversation is not, oh, let's get quick at this. The conversation is, who on earth says 12 minutes? And we know the answer to that, right? We know the answer to that. It's the shareholder of Oxford and Prudential, or whoever makes health policy in this country. So this is many, there's many ways to, you know, open up these questions of how do we get to this task. Yeah. You spoke about shame a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, and it seems like uh, through narrative medicine, you kind of overcome shame by establishing a connection so that there's no longer this fear of being a part of the connection. But once you have that connection established, you never too much goes over a line that's being crossed. Yes, um, indeed there is. And look, persons have different kind of relationships to privacy. And it's, it's not uncommon that somebody doesn't want anything but the most kind of instrumental, come on, I'm here for my flu shot and my capture. And, and so, that's part of what one 
has to read is, you know, what might help. And, and sometimes it's like, real quick, don't take 20 minutes, all I need is the flu shot. So, so that's not, um, that's not on the front. So, but you're asking a deeper question than that. Um, it's only the real, real unskilled clinician who's going to consider it required that a patient expose himself. Each of us, each of us has his or her own set of boundaries. And if there's anything to be known about a person who comes for any kind of service, it's where those boundaries are. And that's not to be violated. Does that answer your question? I mean, th those those are the those are the things we have to think about in these areas. The areas are very very tender. Right? So, and there's all different ways of violating. When I talk about shame, it means that something's been violated. Yeah, some envelope has been, uh, 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 you know, open. The violations are what typically happen. Take all your clothes off and put on this little paper gown. No matter that it doesn't hide your backside. <coughs> Anything. Do you, do you see? Um, so we have to be really, really alert to places of potential violation. That's why all the HIPAA rules are in place, that you're not allowed by law to reveal health information to anyone else. right? Um, it's, uh, and when I say violation, you can tell I'm not just talking about improper sexual relationships between the psychoanalyst and the mouse hand. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about all potential forms of violation. So that constitutes the shame. And that's why the concept of honor is helpful in this regard. Do you know the work by uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah, who's a philosopher at Princeton? He wrote a book recently on the honor code and, and writes about the sources of honor within cultures. Uh, and uh, he's, he's going to come talk with our faculty because as I read that book, I kept saying, but this is what we're trying to do in the clinic, is replace the shame with honor. And, as you think about what honor means, it's kind of the opposite of violation. It's a kind of element. So that's the goal, is that a person who, for whatever reason, is suffering, not only is not violent, but, but is indeed um, elevated. your sovereignty. And it's up to you to tell me what you think I should know about your situation. You see? So I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I don't cry. One or two more. Yes. Um, I've noticed that lately doctors tend to not be alone in the room with the patient. Uh -huh. They always have. 
It is a uh, reduction in the amount of health that can be had. To have a non-chosen other. Now, many persons choose to have an other, and they'll bring their sister or their mother or, or their daughter or someone. And just comparing that to having the PA in there tells us exactly what it is. The daughter is on your side. The daughter is there for you. The PA is there not for you. The PA is there to let the orthopedist see three times as many shoulders as he could without the PA. I was is that right? Well, I was wondering if it's because um, there have been so They're required to. If I do a rectal exam on a man, I'm not required to have a male chaperone. I don't know why. So it goes. <laughs> um, so the chaperone is there for your protection because of the history of sexual violations as male doctors do these things to female patients. But in the case of the physician assistant or the nurse practitioner or the scribe, uh, they're there to take notes or to be able to um, order the blood tests and the x-rays so that the doctor literally goes from examining room to examining room five minutes apiece without being slowed down by the clerical work. That's what it's for. I have yearned to have such a PA sometimes because I say, oh my God, it would save me from all the boring parts. Really? And then I think about what it would mean. Every now and then I have in my office a, a student. Uh, now, look, a minute on this. So, uh, I have learned how much is to be gained for me and the patient, but more me, by having a witness. Because I can't see everything that goes on in the encounter. These are very complex encounters. And within 20 minutes, a great deal happens. Because I'm a participant in that encounter, I can't see everything that happens. And so I occasionally will bring in a witness who I've trained to perceive and represent the visit, the encounter. And I put them through a training. Uh, and I only take, I usually take um, the English majors are the best because they can write. And they're not there to learn internal medicine. They're not there to shatter me. They're there to be the witness. And the witness, and I introduce the person as a witness, and my patients know what that means, and they say yes or no. But of course, if I ask them, they're probably going to say yes. So I know it's powerful enough. Uh, but then what happens is the witness simply observes with fine perception, what goes on, it writes it down, and then gives me those notes, and if it's a good enough witness, we give it to the patient to try to really train them up. Uh, and that does something very important. What it says is, this thing going on in this room is a very big deal, and we want to not squander any of what happens here. I read the witness notes and I say, oh my God, is that what she's 
Or is that when she finally started to relax? I've changed whole routines in my, in my office by virtue of what I've learned from the witness. So, and then when we give it to the patient, and we explain what this is all about, then it becomes just another angle of perception of what went on. So, so that's different, but still, it's more in my service than had the patient brought her sister. So there you go. I think our time is up. Is our time up? I think maybe we can all join and talk to you individually and finish our food. Why don't we do that? Thank you. So